Would you open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 11? And I'll warn you, be ready to flip some pages this morning because we're going to jump around a little bit. But I'll be reading from Mark chapter 11 to start out, by the way. Welcome to Palm Sunday. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? You say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside the street. And they loosed it. And some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing? Loosing the colt. And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. And so they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes out on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and went into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, Palm Sunday, uh, traditionally we believe this was on a Sunday, the first day of the week. Palm Sunday begins the first week of Jesus' uh, the, the, the final week, I should say, the final week of Jesus's three and a half year earthly ministry before his death and resurrection. Now think about this for a minute. Three and a half years equals out to 182 weeks. 182 weeks. This is one week out of 182. And yet it comprises anywhere from one third of the book of Mark to just about half of John's gospel. And most of the miracles that Jesus did, the, the greatest, or I should say, not the miracles, the, the fulfillment of prophecies, the, most of the fulfilled prophecies that Jesus fulfilled uh, happened during this final week, what, what some call Holy Week. And Jesus is introduced uh, to the holy city of Jerusalem as a conquering king, as Messiah. And, and he didn't come to a coronation, but what looked like a coronation quickly turned, as you know, into a crucifixion. And he was not ultimately exalted, but executed by the crowds. Uh, he came in victory. The symbolism of the donkey and the, the white horse is... Uh, is there, but he came rather to die. Uh, this was his obviously last trip into Jerusalem, the last Passover. We'll talk about that on Wednesday night when we celebrate the Lord's table. But um, he came for the, the purpose of his, the ultimate purpose of his ministry, to go to the cross and die for us. And he comes in with, with great pomp and celebration and expectation of the crowds only to have them turn on him and four days later crucify him on a cross. Um, he came from Bethphage, we're told, and Bethany. Bethphage means house of figs. Bethany means kind of the same thing, but it really means house of weeping. Uh, from the Mount of Olives, which as we talked about last year when we looked at the, the Olivet Discourse for something like six weeks in a row, we talked about how the Mount of Olives overlooks the Kidron Valley and you have a beautiful view of the city and you go across the valley into the, into the, the wall, the, the eastern gate and the wall that uh, butts up against the temple, the Temple Mount. And, and so he was coming into the city uh, from Bethphage and Bethany, and that's significant. We'll get to that in a moment. And he had been... We know the night before in the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and that was where Mary, of course, anointed his feet 
and uh, washed them with her hair and poured out that valuable offering of that ointment on, on him. The story of the triumphal entry, as it's called in, in my Bible here and probably most of yours, is included in all the Gospels. It's in uh, Matthew chapter 21, Mark chapter 11, Luke chapter 19, and John chapter 12. Uh, we're told in verses 2 and 3 that he sent his disciples to the village opposite you. Now, that was probably Bethphage. Um, and they, he sent them to get this little cult. And we've talked much about the cult and how it was prophesied and uh, how God had a claim on it. And it was uh, kind of a picture of God's election and and how the disciples were sent to loose it and bring it back. And that's what we're to do. We're to bring people to Jesus. Um, we don't know about this. Stuff. A lot's been made out of this, how he told them to go and get the cult. You know, it may have been that he called up his friend. I don't know how he called in those days. I didn't have phones. But, you know, talked to his friend uh, and said, you know, by the way, next week I'm going to borrow your cult. Uh, I'm going to need it. And it might have been arranged. It may have been something as simple as that. But most people believe that it had more of a, you know, um, omniscient, uh, you know, a, a, a demonstration of his omniscience and his miraculous power that, you know, you'll go find this cult and here's what they're going to say to you. And it, of course, it unfolded just as they, as he told them, um, you know, whether or not it was prearranged and obviously it was prearranged spiritually. It was prophesied 700 years earlier, of course. But uh, Mark and Luke record that the disciples were asked, just as Jesus said, you, know, you have to wonder what they must have been thinking. You know, Jesus said, go, there's a colt tied up on a post. Here's the street. You'll see it there. And uh, how did he know that? And, and then they're going to come out and they're going to ask you, why are you taking the colt? Here's what you say to them. And when you say that, they'll say, oh, okay, go, you know, take the colt. It's fine. And, you know, they, they can you imagine being there taking that colt and, and having it just, just as Jesus said, word for word, exactly what he said, they're, they're saying back to you now, might have been a little spooky or, you know, at least uh, exciting to them that, you know, look at this is happening just as he said. You know, why would we doubt that? Everything that he said is going to happen is going to happen just as he said, right? You know, why do we doubt that? But what must they have been thinking? By the way, I, you know, I, I, this is one thing I have to admit. I, I wish I could do that. I really do. You know, a couple of you guys... Um, up at Jackson Ford, there, there's a, a, a Mustang, Celine Mustang, uh, convertible top parked there on the lot. It's, it's red. And uh, I want you to go get it for me. Go, go pick it up and bring it back here. Anybody asks what you're doing, you just tell them the pastor needs it. Okay. <laughs> I sure wish I could. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, I, I wish I could do that. But all right. So anyway, by the way, as we've been and we've been talking about the subject of revival, I want to just make mention of this. In, in, in Matthew 21 and verse 10, the Bible tells us that when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? Who is this? The city was moved. The city was stirred. Just as at his birth, the Bible says that Herod was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And here they, he's coming into the city and there's obviously this, uh, you know, noise and, and spectacle that's happening down by the gate. And, and people are going out to see it and they're saying, who is this guy? Who is, who is it? Who is it on the horse, on the donkey? Who's coming? It's, uh, the city was stirred, moved. Paul at Athens, Mars Hill. The Bible says his spirit was stirred or provoked within him. By the way, it's the same word that's used when it talks about the, the stirring of the waters at the pool of Bethesda back in chapter 5. Troubled, moved. And I was thinking as I was preparing this, how we need such a movement in our city. How we need our city to be stirred. How we need our church to be stirred. If we could just get our churches to be stirred up. To be moved, to be provoked in our spirits, our nation. What are we praying for? We're praying for revival. That's really what we're talking about. How we need such a movement in our city, in our church, in our nation of the Holy Spirit. And how does that happen? It comes 
through the proclamation of compelling truth and preaching and evangelism and, and faithful daily living before the people so they might see something and say, what's going on here? What is it about you? What, who's at work in your life? What's happening here? The people asked, who is this? If only they would wonder in our day. You remember Elijah, we talked last week, Elijah prayed. What was his prayer? What was his, do you remember? Lord, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. Hear me, O Lord, he said. Hear me that this people may know that you are the Lord. If only people in our day would be so stirred up that they'd have to ask, who is this God you're talking about? Who is this Jesus we've heard about? Who is he? You know, it kind of reminds me of uh, the end of Psalm 24. It says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory will come in. And the people say, who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Who is this king of glory? Lift up your heads, O ye gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory will come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. What a wonderful scene this must have been. What, a, what an opportunity. Who is this? Who is this guy? It all begins right here. Number one. I've got three short points for you today. Number one. The identity of Jesus. It all begins with that. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, well, some say this or that. And in verse 15, he said, okay, but who do you say that I am? Let me ask you that today. Who do you know Jesus to be? Do you know him as your savior? I hope you do. Better, do you know him as your Lord? Do you know him as your friend? Do you know him as Jehovah Jireh, my provider? Do you know him as the faithful teacher, the faithful friend, the Savior, the Lamb of God that takes away your sin. Who is Jesus? Who was the crowd saying that he was? In Matthew 21, 9, the, the multitudes that went before him and those who followed after cried out saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. And that's a messianic title. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The son of David, the Messiah. The Messiah has come. In John chapter 12, it says, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The king of Israel. This is the king of Israel. This is the king of glory. This is the Messiah. This is the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. All of this was in fulfillment of prophecy. And that was the question, who is Jesus? And people wondered. And now we're seeing the clues beginning to fall into place in this last week, Holy Week. Everything is coming together. The prophecies are being fulfilled in rapid succession. The jigsaw puzzle pieces are coming together and we're beginning to see the picture clearly. I wanna take you back to Zechariah. Zechariah, the most familiar passage, I think, that uh, people associate with this, this event. Zechariah 9 and verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. King of Israel. We see it in Matthew 21 and, and, and verse 5, where it's, it's quoted. Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, the king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, the colt, the foal of a donkey. Why the donkey? Why the colt? Well, it was prophesied 700 years earlier. And so Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a colt the foal of a donkey. But even before that, there's another set of prophecies that are being fulfilled. And that goes back to the book of Genesis in verse chapter 49, verses one through 11. You remember Jacob called his sons together 
He said, gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. And he gave out the patriarchal blessings to his sons. And you remember he bypassed Reuben, who was the firstborn. It says in verse three, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellence of dignity, the excellence of power, unstable as water, you shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed and you defiled it. You went up to my couch. So because of his sin, Reuben is bypassed. He didn't get the patriarchal blessing. And then likewise, Simeon and Levi, in verse five, Simeon and Levi are brothers, instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let my, not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Do you think about how many blessings we miss out on because of our sin? Wow. I don't want to bring you all down today, but boy, what a, what a thought. How many blessings have we missed out on because of our sin? Because of a sin in our life. We never dreamed it would have the ramifications that it did. But then we come to verse 8. And he says, Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp, a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down and he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? And so Jesus is identified, by the way, it was Judah that would be the line of the kings, David and on down, not Saul. Saul was from Benjamin, but, but uh, David was from the, the, the tribe of Judah. And, and Jesus is referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's a messianic title. In Revelation 5 and verse 5, it says, one of the elders asked me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. And he says in verse 10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. This is an interesting verse. The scepter, of course, is the king's staff. It's the symbol of his authority, his kingship. And Shiloh, he says, the, sh the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Now, some people talk about Shiloh as a place, and they think the verse should say, until he comes to Shiloh. I disagree, because Shiloh ultimately, in, in the ancient Hebrew language, means something very significant. It means this, him to whom it belongs. So put, put it in that context. The scepter shall not depart from Judah until he to whom it belongs shall come. In other words, Messiah. Shiloh is a, a word. He that to whom it belongs or, or pertains, I believe, refers to the Messiah. And then verse 11 talks about binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. Here we have the donkey again. It says, he washed his garments in wine, his clothes in the blood of grapes. His garments are washed in blood. And that's built into the Jews' belief, this, this deeply rooted hope and expectation of their king coming not on a stallion, but on a donkey, lowly, in victory. And incidentally, by the way, the Jews, the ancient Jews had a, a concept of what, what we might call eminent domain. So one of the prerogatives of a king was that whenever he needed a, a, a beast of burden, a horse, he had the right to commandeer that, that animal whenever it was needed. And here's a sign of Jesus as the king exercising that right. And the Bible speaks about a colt that had never been ridden. And we talked about it in Sunday school this morning. We've talked about it before, how a colt is wild by nature. And you don't just sit on it and ride it. But Jesus, by his omnipotence, by his power, he subdued the colt and, and rode on it. Just as he changes our nature. Just as we, being wild and sinful by nature, will not come to him. But he, by his spirit, calms us and draws us to him and, and brings us to him against our nature, not our nature to seek after God. 
But there's something else here, and that is the fact that nobody rode the king's horse. Nobody was allowed to ride the king's horse. The Lord needs it. The word Lord here could simply mean master, but more likely it's a reference to the fact that Jesus is Lord and God and King and Messiah, the King of Israel, as he's described, as he's called. And the king rode a horse that no one else would ever ride, had ever ridden or would ever ride because nobody else rides the king's horse. Verses seven and eight tells us that they, they threw their clothes on it and on the road. Now here we have a reference back to the Old Testament once again. And who, we talked about last week, the, that wicked king, who was the most wicked king in all of the history of Israel? Ahab and his wife, Hillary, I mean, uh, Jezebel. No question about it. Ahab introduced radical paganism and idolatry into Israel. Finally, God had had enough, and he announced to Elisha that he was going to replace Ahab, and so he sent him to anoint his successor, Jehu. And what did they do? They spread their garments out before him, the one who was anointed king. 2 Kings 9 and verse 12 says, Thus and thus he spoke to me, saying, Thus says the king, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then each man hastened to take his garment and put it under him on the top of the steps, and they blew trumpets and said, Jehu is king. And so it was a custom to lay out the garments for the king to process upon. Now the procession begins in Bethany, and this is really cool. Because the procession began in Bethany and proceeded down the Mount of Olives, which is not a huge mountain. It's, it's a small hill, probably 300 feet or so. Maybe big. I don't know. But it's not big. Across the Kidron Valley, and Jesus entered through the Eastern Gate. And in 586 BC, at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, the hands of the Babylonians, the beginning of the Babylonian captivity, when Jerusalem fell, God gave Ezekiel a vision. Jerusalem, the temple. And in that vision, he saw the glory of God rise up from the temple and depart from the eastern gate, across the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives, and then come back down and rest and settle there on the Mount of Olives. The glory had departed. Remember back in Samuel's day, the, when Ichabod was born, Ichabod means the glory has departed because the Ark of the Covenant had been stolen. Something similar happens here. And, and uh, Ezekiel has this vision of the glory of God departing out through the Eastern Gate and going up Mount of Olives. And now Jesus begins his journey in Bethlehem. I'm sorry, in Bethany, in Bethany on the Mount of Olives, comes back through that very eastern gate. And the people wave their palm branches and they shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. To the Lord. Isaiah 40 and verse 5 says, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Isaiah 60 and verse 1 says, the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. I want to take you to Psalm 118, where this, these words are first recorded. Beginning in verse 19, it says, Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected. By the way, this is... The part of the, the song is called the Hallel. This is what they sang on Passover night when it says in the Bible, they, they drank the cup and then they sung the hymn and they went out. The hymn that, was right here, that the Jews sang on Passover night is the Hallel. Listen to the words. This is the gate of the Lord which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you for you have answered me. You've become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now. 
Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Save now is the translation of the Hebrew word Hosanna. Save now. Hosanna, I pray, O Lord. Send prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. And incidentally, in this case, something happened that had never happened before in Jesus' earthly ministry. In Luke chapter 19 and verse uh, 37, it says, as they were drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him and said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Rebuke your disciples. You hear what they're saying? Aren't you going to correct them? And Jesus said, I tell you, that if these should keep silent, the rocks would immediately cry out. The stones would cry out. What's happening here? For the first time, I believe, I could be wrong, but for the first time, Jesus accepted their public worship. All the other times when they tried to make him king, when, they, when he would do a miracle and they'd say, oh, this is the Messiah, he'd say, no, shh, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone what you just what you've heard. Go your way and don't tell anyone. Here he's accepting their worship. No question here. There's no question who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. He is the King of Israel. He is the glory. That is to say, the revelation of the Lord. John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld, what? His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is revealed in all of his glory, in all of his majesty, in all of his splendor. Just prior to this had been the, the, trans, the, the transfiguration that only the few disciples were allowed to see. He is Lord. And he's going to prove that a week later by rising from the dead. He is Lord. And here he accepts the worship of the people. Uh, he is most certainly not the popular notion of who he is today. A good man. A good moral teacher. That, my friends, is not an option. You remember the trilemma that was put forth, I believe, by C.S. Lewis. may have been someone before him, but C.S. Lewis wrote about it. It said that Jesus is either Lord or a liar or a lunatic. But he cannot be anything in between. If he claimed to be God knowingly, he lied. A good moral teacher doesn't lie. And if he thought he would, if he was so delusional that he thought he was God and was not, well, then he's some kind of lunatic. And again, certainly not worthy of any worship or adoration or, or devotion. But no, he is Lord. He, he was not a good man or a great moral teacher, merely a good man and a great moral teacher. That's not an option. In Matthew chapter 22, he, he sort of put forth his own version of the trial. I mean, he said, Who do you think the Christ, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said, the son of David. And he said to them, well, okay, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. If David calls him Lord, then how is he his son? And by the way, that's in the context of the great commandment telling them that you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, mind and all your, all your might, all your strength. You can't be just a great man and a good moral teacher. Nice men don't tell lies and great moral teachers tell the truth. 
What he said about himself is not true, then he lied, and he's not a good moral teacher. He is most certainly God in flesh, Lord of all, Son of God, Son of Man, Messiah, King of Israel. And here he accepted the worship of the people. Let me move on to number two, and I want to talk about something that you might not think about in this context, but I, I think it's very significant, and that's in, in John chapter 12, in, in John's account of this. Uh, I want to talk about the integrity of John. We talk about the identity of Jesus. I want to tell you about the integrity of John. Here's what John says in verse 16, chapter 12, verse 16. His disciples, let me, let me read it in, in its context. John chapter 12. Since the next day, a great multitude came to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of palm trees, went out to meet him, and cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Here's verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, meaning risen from the dead, then they remembered that these things were written about him and, and that they had done these things to him. It's amazing that John would write that into the text. We didn't understand what was going on at the time. It's amazing evidence of the truth. Most people wouldn't write that. I find it also very comforting because there's a lot of times in my life, how about you, where I don't understand what God's doing. I don't get what he's up to. I, it doesn't seem to make any sense to me what he's doing. And yet we trust him. We don't always get it. Mark chapter 6, Jesus fed 5,000. He sends them out across the sea in a boat and, and the storm arises. He comes to them walking on water, and they think he's a ghost. They think he's a ghost. They said in, in chapter 6 and verse 52, they, had they, they did not understand about the loaves because their hearts were hardened. He says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He's talking about their doctrine and their pride. They thought it was because they hadn't taken any bread with them. And he says, wait a minute. When I fed the 5,000, how many loaves did you pick up? And he said, well, about 12 baskets. He said, after we fed the 4,000 a week later, how many did you pick up? Well, seven baskets. He's like, you guys are thinking I'm talking about bread? You worry about bread? Matthew chapter 16 and verse 11. He says, how is it you didn't understand? I'm not talking about bread. I'm not talking about bread. <laughs> Mark chapter 8, turn, turn with me. Mark, Mark chapter 8. I told you we we're going to flip around a lot. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise again the third day. Chapter 9, verse 12. Sorry. Son of man must suffer many things and be treated with contempt. Verse 30. They departed from there and they passed through the Galilee and he did not want anyone to know it. He, he taught his disciples and said to them, the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him. And after that he will, is killed, he will rise the third day. Verse 32. They didn't understand this saying and they were afraid to ask him what he meant. And... Chapter 8, verse 31. He began to teach them. He must be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. They didn't understand about this rising from the dead. They questioned what this rising from the dead meant. How do you not understand that? 
How do you not get that? <laughs> John chapter 14. Here's another one. John chapter 14 and verse 4. He says, where I go, you know, the way you know. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? And he says to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Verse 8, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and it'll be sufficient for us. And Jesus says, have I been with you so long and yet you don't know me, Philip? What? How do you say, show me the Father? I've been with you for three and a half years. You say, show me the Father. Luke chapter 24, one of my favorite passages. Luke chapter 24, Jesus is talking to the two on the road to Emmaus. And uh, verse 16, it says, their eyes were restrained and they didn't know him. They didn't recognize him. And in uh, verse 25, he says to them, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then verse 31, then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. You see why this is a piece of evidence? And we'll get more into it next week when we talk about the resurrection, but you know, apart from the resurrection, none of these guys would have written any of this stuff down. It was game over, he's dead, get over it, let's move on. They didn't get it. The crowd is, oh, Hosanna to the King of David, King of Israel, the Son of David, the Messiah has come, the glory of God has come. And they're like, oh, I wonder what they mean by that. That was weird. What, did that, what, was, all, what was that all about? And that brings me to the third point, and it's this. We talked about the identity of Jesus the integrity of John, his honesty, his transparency, saying we didn't even, we didn't get it, we didn't know what was going on. And then finally, the imperative of grace. You see, the same way it took the power of the Holy Spirit to open their eyes in Luke chapter 24, it's the same with us. It's the same with you. I, I can't persuade you to trust Jesus Christ. I can't persuade anyone of the existence of God. R.C. Sproul, I was listening to Sproul this week, and he said, you know, it's kind of a fool's errand. He said, to try to persuade somebody the existence of God, to try to persuade someone of what the Bible says they know already, Romans chapter one. They already know that there's a God and they hate him because they refuse to submit to him. They will not believe. They've been blinded by the God of this age. It's only by his grace that he's revealed and made known to us. In fact, that's just the facts, that's just reality. Philippians chapter two and verse nine says, therefore God has highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, the things in heaven and on earth and the things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We only come to him by his grace. Second Corinthians eight and verse nine says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. You, you all know Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, lest anyone should boast. Romans 11 and verse 6, it says, if it's, it's by grace, it's no longer by works, or else grace is not grace. And if it's by works, it's no longer, it's not about grace. Otherwise, works are not works. God reveals himself to us by the power of the Holy Spirit, by his grace. And that grace is, imper it is essential or no one will believe. What the grace of God will do, it'll change you. You know, it's, it's interesting to see how people respond. What do we say our, our response to God is? Our worship, right? Notice the people crying out and singing making a joyful noise. 
And the religious crowd was bothered by this. They didn't like it. They were bothered by it. Luke chapter 19, he was drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees called him and said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said to them, I tell you, if these should keep silent, the rocks would immediately cry out. Matthew 21 records it this way. The chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple and saying hosanna to the son of david they were indignant indignant that means really really mad they said to him do you hear what these people are saying jesus said yes yes and haven't you read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise get it? Jesus said in Matthew 18 and verse 3, unless you come as a child, a little child, you'll never enter the kingdom. So I'm not criticizing your singing. That's not my point. But I, I do want to say this. I don't get why people don't want to sing to the Lord. You know? I, I know I can't give my voice to something that I don't understand or I don't believe in. I mean, I can't go out and I can't go out and celebrate what's going on in Washington right now. I can't celebrate what's going on at the border, southern border. I think it's terrible. I can't celebrate the fact that we have our first transgender cabinet member. I think that's terrible. I think it's disgraceful. And I don't hate this man who thinks he's a woman, I, that's, not my, that's not where I'm coming from. I just think it's terrible that, that this, is something, this, this is something that we glorify in our day. We celebrate. I can't celebrate that because I don't believe in that. I, I don't want any part of that. But I can't understand why people wouldn't want to celebrate Jesus unless there's a spiritual issue. Psalm 107 and verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. When you're saved, you want to make a joyful noise. You want to worship the Lord. Worship is our response to God for who he is and what he's done. So do we, number one, do we understand the identity of Jesus? And number two, do we see what he's done? Has he done something in your life? Has he saved you? The problem is that they and many in the crowd wanted an earthly deliverer. They wanted, oh, they wanted the earthly Messiah. They wanted, did you read it even in the Psalms? Give us prosperity now. Prosperity. People greeted and worshipped him with great joy and anticipation and enthusiasm. The religious leaders were troubled by this. Everyone expected a Messiah who would come in and Save them from the nation and save the nation from the Roman occupation, Roman conquerors. But Jesus came to save us from our sin. How's that grab you? Why do you receive him in that light? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to read too much into this, but even, even this word, Hosanna, save now. Save now. Now. Jesus is like, not now. Not yet. First, I'll go clean up the temple. Then I'll go to the cross. Take away your sin. Then, have salvation. What's it take to change our nature? Same thing it took for Jesus to be able to sit on that unbroken colt that had never been ridden. The power of God must transform our hearts. We must be regenerated. Unless we're born again, we won't see the kingdom of God. So I, invitation is quite simple. The king has come. 
The Messiah has come. The Savior of the world has come. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, John said. Will you embrace him? Will you receive him today? Heavenly Father, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, we, we stand before you. You see our hearts. You see what, right through us. Father, I pray that you would examine us. Lord, if there's any here today that don't know you as Savior and Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would change their nature and give them grace to call on your name and be saved by your miraculous power. Father, we give you glory. Hosanna in the highest. Save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel, our Lord and our King. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name.